I've mentioned graphic transformations of functions in at least three videos so far, and every time I make the same comment about how the horizontal axis is weird and annoying and it does the exact opposite of what you would expect it to do, and I don't feel like explaining why this happens in every single video over and over again. So today I am going to show you the three parts of videos that I remember when I said those things. And then I'm going to finally explain to you why the horizontal axis is annoying. I'm going to explain it in two different ways. And then I'm going to ask you which one is your favorite. Okay. So here I have the four basic types of graphic transformations. You have your translations and your stretches, uh, and both of those can be either vertical or horizontal. The basic idea is that translations is when you add a number and that doesn't change the shape of the function. It just moves it around either vertically or horizontally. And the stretches are when you multiply the function by a number instead of adding. So twice f is going to be a vertical stretch that makes it bigger. So it stretches it and the horizontal is this way. And what you should notice is that the vertical transformations uh, are doing something to the value of the function. So that is the y axis, which is why it's vertical. This one is adding and this one is multiplying, but this operation is happening to the function itself. So to the value of the function, which means that it's a vertical transformation. While both horizontal transformations are doing this operation to the value of x. So this is x plus 2 and this is 2 times x. So x is the horizontal variable. This operation happens to the independent variable before the function even happens. So that is why the stretch or this translation are horizontal instead of vertical. But what I mean when I say that the horizontal axis acts backwards is that plus two, what do you expect? You expect it to go up, right? That is what happens in vertical translations. And times two, what do you expect? You expect it to become bigger. And that is exactly what happens in the vertical stretch. But in the horizontal translation, plus two, what do you expect? You expect the function to go to the right, but what does it do? It actually goes to the left. Um, and the horizontal stretch, when you multiply x by two, you would expect it to get bigger like this, but what actually happens is that it becomes smaller like this. So it's backward. So we do horizontal translations by adding a number to x. The x-axis works backwards in terms of transformation. So moving x plus 3 has made me shift my whole function to the left. x mais 2 ao quadrado, x mais 3 ao quadrado. O que está acontecendo com o gráfico da função, que é o azul? Ele está indo cada vez mais para a esquerda. Já se o número b, que eu estou somando no x, vai ficando menor, fica até negativo, já aí a parábola está andando para a direita, tá bom? Isso é uma peculiaridade da translação horizontal, que você tem que sempre pensar o sinal do número ao contrário. Se você quiser que a sua função ande para a direita, você tem que fazer f de x menos alguma coisa. E se você quiser que a função vá para a esquerda, aí sim vai ser f de x mais alguma coisa. Because multiplying x by a number is what makes a horizontal stretch, okay? And the important thing to keep in mind in horizontal graphic transformations is that they do the opposite of what you would expect them to do. For example, if you do f of x plus 4, then it's going to the left instead of going to the right. Uh, if you do f of 2x, instead of making the thing bigger, you're actually making it smaller. So f of 2x is a horizontal stretch of scale factor a half. So here's the first example, x plus pi over 6. So that's pi over 6 to the left. And sine of pi over 6 is a half. It gets even more confusing when you want to do a horizontal stretch 
and a horizontal translation on the same function like this red one that I'm about to draw. So it's sine of 2x plus pi over 6. The 2x is going to make a horizontal stretch of scale factor a half, so it's going to become half as big. But notice that when x equals 0, you're still getting the same value, sine of pi over 6, which is half. So the red function is also going to have that same y-intercept. And all of this confusing stuff happens for kind of the same reason as the confusion about the x-axis that has always been there. The fact that adding 2 makes you go 2 to the left, the fact that multiplying by 2 makes you become smaller, it also messes with the order of operations. Because when you say 2 times x and then plus pi over 6, it looks like the priority would be the multiplication. So you would do the stretch first and then the translation. But that's not really what's happening, at least if you remember how I did the blue picture. First, I shifted it to the left by pi over 6 and put the y-intercept there. And then I scaled it down by a half. So let me do an example here with this function, which I'm calling f, and I'm going to do both translations. The vertical is going to be red, and the horizontal is going to be green. So the vertical translation is nothing special, really. You just take the value of the function at any value of x that you want, and then you add 1 to that value, so it goes up. For example, if f of 2 was 3, then 3 plus 1 is 4, and g of 2 is going to be 4. So you have that point over there. Same thing for x equals 3. f of 3 is 4, 4 plus 1 is 5, so g of 3 is 5. That's the new point. Those two points are just examples, but the same thing is happening to every single point, so you're going to get the whole function moving up. Okay, but here is what happens when you want to do the horizontal transformation. Say you want to figure out what is h of 2, what is the value of h of 2. Well, according to this rule, h of x is f of x plus 1, so h of 2 is f of 2 plus 1, which is f of 3. And the same thing is going to happen for every number. h of 3 is f of 3 plus 1, which is f of 4, and so on. So when you want to do the graph, what you have to do is to figure out these points. I want to sketch 2h2, but what is h2 is f3. So it's like you have to go a little bit to the right to figure out what the value of the function needs to be. So what is h of 2? Is it here? Well, no, it's supposed to be f of 3, but f of 3 is this point. So this is going to be the value of h of 2. And what about h of 3? At which value of y should I put my green function here? Well, I have to go look at 4 and see the value of f of 4. f of 4 is here, so h of 3 is the same as f of 4. So it needs to be here. Well, what about h of 4? That's going to be f of 5. f of 5 is here. So that is the value of h of 4. So that is how I end up pulling all my function to the left, because this plus 1 tells me that in order to find what the value is, I have to go look at what the function is doing a little bit to the right. But then I'm not going to draw it right there. I'm going to bring it back to the value of x. Where am I going to draw h of 7? Well, I have to look at 8. I find this point, so I have to bring it back here, because h of 7 is f of 8. Those are the same values, so they are horizontal. And it goes on like that for every single value of x. You see what happens in the end is that the function is brought all the way to the left. But that explanation is not completely satisfying to me, because x and y work differently due to the fact that one is the independent variable and one is the dependent variable. So one of the kinds of transformations you have to look at before the function is applied to the value, and the other one you're looking at it after the function has already been applied, because in horizontal transformations, the operation is happening to the x, so that's still inside of the parentheses of the function, and for the vertical transformations, that will be outside, right? So after the function has already been applied. 
But maybe it feels like this distinction is artificial because if you just look at the coordinate plane, x and y are just two coordinates of the points. So I should be able to have another explanation for that that doesn't depend on the fact that I'm looking at one as an independent variable and the other one as a dependent variable. You're going to get an explanation like that if you look at these pictures that we draw not as the graph of a function, which is something that intrinsically has an independent variable and a dependent variable, which are two different things. Uh, but if you just look at this curve as the set of points in the coordinate plane that obey this relationship here. So y is x squared, what does that mean? It means that for each point on this curve, its coordinates x and y obey this relationship. So this y is that x squared. And that other point over there as well, that x is not the same number as this x, and that y is not the same number as this y, but this pair of numbers x, y also obey this relationship. That's why they are on the curve. So again, you should look at the curve as the set of points all of the points on the plane that obey this relationship. When this becomes a function is when we say y equals f of x, right? So we look at x squared as a function, but I don't want to look at that right now. So let's say from each of these points on this curve, I am going to do the same translation. I am going to do three to the right and two up then there's nothing backwards happening here. This is in the direction that you expect. X plus three is because X has moved to the right and Y plus two is up because Y has moved up plus two. And the same thing is going to happen to that point as well. I actually want this to happen to all of the points on the black curve. So I'm going to get a red curve that has been translated in this way, three to the right and two up. And every single point on the red curve is the translation of a point in the black curve. So that's why they all have the same name here. Just keep in mind that the values of X and Y are different for each point. What I would like to have now is an equation for the red curve. I want to write down what is the rule that all of the points of the red curve are obeying. So I want to refer to the red points as just X and Y now, because I want to write down an equation that is the rule that all of the red points are obeying in their X and Y coordinates. But when I write them this way, then I have to remember that each red point came from a black point. So now I want to call the corresponding black point as X minus three and Y minus two. Again, there is nothing backwards going on here. It's minus three because it's to the left and it's minus two because it's down, just like you expect coordinates of points to do. But now I am going to write the equation for the red curve according to what I remember about the black curve. In the black curve, I remember that the Y coordinate has to be the X coordinate squared. And that is exactly the rule that the red points are following. A point X, Y is red if the corresponding point X minus three and Y minus two is black, which means that the X minus three coordinate squared is equal to the Y minus two coordinate. There's nothing backwards going on here. You get that effect of something being backwards when you want to write this as the graph of a function. Because when you want to write it as the graph of a function, you don't want your equation to start with y minus two. You just want your equation to start with y equals blah, 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 because that will be the expression of the function. So how do you change this into that? You just add two to both sides to cancel out this negative two here. And it's when you do that, that one of them gets a negative sign and the other one gets a positive sign. They were both negative signs before. This one has just gotten moved to the other side of the equation. And you can do this kind of thing with curves that aren't the graphs of functions as well. Uh, since we're only looking at X and Y as the coordinates of points in the plane, then this shape doesn't really need 
to pass the vertical line test in order to get an equation that describes the rule that its points follow. For example, if you want the equation of a circle with center at this point AB and radius R, one of the ways that you can think of this is that you are going to translate this circle onto that circle that has a center at the origin. And that happens by subtracting A from X so that the center of the new circle is going to move to the left by subtraction and subtracting B from Y so that it goes down by subtraction. And now you think about what is the equation of the black circle? Well, the radius hasn't changed. The radius is still R. So if you know that the equation of a circle centered at the origin is that this thing squared plus this thing squared needs to be the radius squared, then you also know that this is how to write the equation of the green circle. Because first you look at its points x, y, think about their corresponding translated points x minus y, y minus b, apply that to the equation of that circle, and there you go.